So good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar series. We'll be discussing protecting and improving the health and well-being of populations. Once again, I am Dr. Tondo Cleopatra Uzosike, and we'll take the following outline. Our learning objectives today would be to appreciate terms in defining health and well-being of populations. We would know about factors that can affect population health and well-being. We would see the importance of health and well-being of populations, and we'll know about strategies to improving population health and well-being. So by way of defining terms, we'll start with health. The World Health Organization has defined health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And to break that definition down, we'll look at physical, mental, and social well-being in detail. The physical well-being is the ability to perform physical activities and carry out social roles without any physical limitations or experience of bodily pain. And mental well-being is the ability of individuals to cope with normal stresses of life and function productively. The social health or well-being encompasses a sense of social belonging and inculcates positive attitudes towards others and believing in the potential for society to evolve positively. Well-being itself is a positive feeling which a patient experiences or a person experiences and in the absence of ill health, the person feels that he has accomplished his goals and by achieving these goals, he feels well and good. That's the definition for well-being. When we talk about population health, two more terms come into play and that's community health and public health. Community health can be regarded as um, the study of an improvement of the health of status of different communities. And it focuses on geographical areas and includes primary, secondary, and tertiary health care. Public health, as we all know, is the science and the art of preventing disease, prolonging life, and promoting health through organized human efforts. And it incorporates interdisciplinary approaches such as uh, epidemiology, biostatistics, occupational health, and other important subfields. This table shows uh, the target audience we usually get for when we talk about population health, community health, and public health, and the possible programs or initiatives that take place when we are talking about those terms. For population health, the target audience would be enrollees or members of specific health programs such as disease uh, program management for diabetes or asthma or employee, uh, employee wellness programs. And then community health looks at target audience affiliated by geography or potential characteristics with a prescribed community. The health initiative would include health education programs or clinical and community health outreach programs, which are usually subsidized by healthcare organizations. Public health looks at target audience like all residents of an area targeted for health initiative, often geographically defined. And the initiative examples can be monitoring disease programs, food and water safety programs, or injury or violence prevention programs. Now we're going to discuss population health and well-being in detail. Population health is a term that has been in the medical dictionary or lexicon for quite a number of years. And it is defined as health outcomes of groups of individuals, the distribution or determinants of such health outcomes within the group and policies or interventions that link these two, the health outcomes and the distribution of the health outcomes. Now these groups can include communities, company employees, ethnic groups, disabled persons, or any other defined groups. In the definition of population health, we have three tiers, the health outcomes, the distribution or determinants of the health outcomes, policies and interventions. These health outcomes looks at dependent variables like mobility, mortality, and quality of life. Uh, and that's the first tier or first level. The second tier looks at determinants or distribution of the health outcomes. And it takes into consideration issues of medical care, 
social environment, the physical environment, genetics, and indi um, individual behavior. And the third tier looks at policies and interventions that influence um, the population at individual, social, or organizational levels. So this um, picture just depicts the definition of population health. It shows that policies and interventions can, uh, can influence the distribution and determinants of health and can also influence health outcomes uh, within the population. This is a more detailed diagram showing how policies and programs at the bottom influences uh, the determinants of health by the right and the health outcomes by the left. And if you look at those health outcomes by the left, you have what we call the disparity. It means that these health outcomes um, can differ um, due to certain factors such as race, ethnicity, uh, socioeconomic status, geography or the area where you live and gender. So let's take a look at the first tier of um, uh, which is the health outcomes when we are talking about the definition of population health. Mortality and life expectancy are two basic measures of population health and they help answer questions about the population that goes beyond health. Mortality outcomes can include crude mortality rate, age specific mortality rate, for example, infant mortality rate, sex specific mortality rate, injury, disease, or country specific mortality rate. So I'd like us to participate in a little exercise now. I would like us to put in the chat box some other examples of age specific mortality rates that you know that we can use as indicators to measure health outcomes. We can also put in the chat box some disease specific mortality rates that you know that we can use to measure population health outcomes. Life expectancy as one of the health outcome indicators is the average number of years an individual can be expected to live. It gives a picture of the future of that population. So for example, if people live longer, what does it mean concerning the working population or healthcare plans? Measures of life expectancy can include life expectancy at birth and life expectancy at age 65. Now, if you take a look at this chart, it shows um, the life expectancy of different regions of the world. Um, a region like Oceania began to see increases in life expectancy around the 1870s, while Africa didn't begin to see increases until around the 1920s. And since then, life expectancy has doubled. In Oceania, life expectancy moved from 35 years to 79 years. In Europe, it moved from 34 years to 79 years. In Africa, life expectancy moved from 26 years to 63 years. And globally, the life expectancy increased from an average of 29 years to 73 years in 2019. So life expectancy as a population health outcome measure can help you to have a, a health plan for your population. If you have a large percentage of the population growing into old age, then you should have a health plan for chronic diseases or diseases that are common among the elderly. For a, a region like Nigeria, where the life expectancy at birth is around 63 years, it means that you have to have a health plan because this still falls into the working population age group. So you should have a, a health plan so that people don't just live and die just after um, they pass the working population age group. They should be able to live even beyond their working population age, retire and live um, uh, a healthy, uh, aged life. So the measures described above provide information about mortality and longevity of populations, uh, but not about the contribution of specific diseases injuries and other underlying conditions. Other indicators used to measure health outcomes of populations include the percentage of adults who report fair or poor health, percentage of adults who report a disability, for example, limitations of vision or hearing, and years of healthy life lived. 
So these indicators can tell about morbidity occurring in populations. Of course, there are various other uh, indicators of population health outcomes, but these are the few that are listed for the purpose of this discussion. The second tier in the definition of population health looks at the determinants of health, and it's often called the social determinant of health. It is defined as the environment in which people are born, they live, they work, they play, and in this, this environment can affect a wide range of health functioning and quality of life outcomes. The social determinants of health do not exist in isolation from each other. Their combined influence determines health status. Now, there are several social determinants of health models, um, but for the purpose of this discussion, we'll be looking at the CDC Healthy People 2020 approach model. And this is uh, the diagram of the social determinants of health, Healthy People 2020 model. It has five main domains the neighborhood and built environment, the health and healthcare, the social and community context, education, economic stability. These five main domains have key issues or underlying factors um, that you should consider. So for economic stability, we look at issues of employment, food insecurity, poverty. Um, these are a few listed. And then for education, we can look at childhood education, language and literacy, high school enrollment. For social and community context, we look at civic participation, social cohesion, discrimination. For health and healthcare, we have access to primary healthcare. Health literacy. And for the neighborhood and built environment, we can look at it. So when discussing the social determinants of health, we have a little exercise here for you. Um, why is Jason in the hospital? Because he has a bad infection in his leg. But why does he have an infection? Because he has a cut on his leg and it got infected. But why does he have a cut on his leg? Because he was playing in the junkyard next to his apartment building and there was some sharp jack steel there that he fell on. But why was he playing in the junkyard? Because his neighborhood is kind of run down and kids play, play there and there's no one to supervise them. But why does he live in that neighborhood? Because his parents can't afford a nicer place to live. But why can't his parents afford a nicer place to live? Because his dad is unemployed and his mom is sick. But why is his dad unemployed? Because he doesn't have much education and he can't find a job. But why? The questions are unending. I would like us at this point from this um, story to put down in the chat section the various domains of social determinants of health that you can identify from this story. And let's see how interconnected they are. The importance of the social determinants of health is that they have direct impact on our health. They can interact and are interconnected with each other to produce a health outcome. They structure behavior and they can predict population health outcomes. The third tier is the policies and programs that influence population health. Remember that from the diagram, policies and programs can influence the social determinants of health and can influence population health outcomes. A policy is a statement of intent that guides decision and helps to achieve a rational outcome. It can be um, put out in form of laws, rules, regulations, and programs. It sets priorities to guide action, to influence behavior, or change what would otherwise occur. A program is a plan of action or interventions aimed at accomplishing an objective with details on what work is to be done, by whom, when, and what means or resources will be used. Policies can operate on a number of different levels. It can influence primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention. 
Of course, we know primary prevention is the avoidance of the occurrence of disease uh, uh, by reducing exposure to health risk. While secondary prevention just includes preventing the disease from going into complications, uh, disability, or death. Now, aside health policies, there is a call among world leaders um, to look into health in all policies. And the health in all policies approach is one that considers the health implication of any policy that is being put in place. So for example, health departments would partner with transportation department to ensure that new transportation projects are evaluated more than their, um, based on their health implications, such as walkability and safety. So for a place like Nigeria, instead of our traditional um, to, uh, two lanes for roads, we can build lanes for cyclists, we can build lanes for uh, pedestrians or those who want to go for a walk. So in that way, you are considering um, health in your uh, transportation policy. Now, um, we mentioned earlier that, health, uh, that policies can influence both primary and uh, secondary prevention, including tertiary prevention. So we want to um, give an example. I'll just take the first one. Assuming you have a health policy on tobacco and the policy objective includes uh, protecting people from secondhand smoke and raising tobacco prices through taxation. That way, if you um, increase the prices of tobacco, those who are very young or those who are poor may not be able to afford it. And in that light, you have um, influenced primary prevention because they don't get exposed to the tobacco product. Then by way of regulation, if you say um, there should be no smoking in public places, that way you have um, made done an enforcement and the public is not exposed to uh, secondhand smoke. So that's one of the ways that um, uh, your policy can influence primary prevention. Of course, by way of education, when they put up their uh, advertisements, they always end up with a statement that tobacco smoking is dangerous to health. So that way people are informed that if you use that product, it can uh, damage your health. So that's another way that policies can influence uh, primary prevention. So let's take a look at some strategies to improving uh, population health and well-being. The Institute for Healthcare uh, improvements put up the triple aim approach and in a bit to improving population health and well-being. It takes a look at population health at the top, improving population health. It takes a look at um, improving the experience of patients when they want to assess health care by the left. Um, and then it takes a look at reducing per capita cost of health care services. So as part of improving the patient experience of care, we have to look at the quality of care. When patients come to the hospital, are they delayed? Is the timing right for them? Is there some form of empathy? Do they understand what is being done for them? Are the patients satisfied with the services? And do our services meet their expectations? So that is what aspects that we can look at in order to improve uh, the patient's experience and ultimately improve population health. The second aspect is improving the health of populations. So for that, we can look at the clinical and health status indicators. What percentage of, for example, hypertensive patients have their blood pressure controlled? What percentage of the diabetic patients have their uh, fasting blood glucose controlled? How many patients or how many people in the community can you say report good or fair health status? So with that, you'll be able to, based on your findings, you'll be able to work on how you can improve the health of populations. The last is reducing the per capita cost of healthcare by improving efficiency in care delivery and lowering cost. How can we improve efficiency in healthcare delivery? For so I, I would like to use Nigeria as an example again. Sometimes a patient comes and says he has fever and you tell the person that he will do, do a test, uh, most likely a malaria parasite test, and then he should come back three days later for the result. 
the cost of transportation going to the coming back to the hospital, the delay that he has may make his health even worsen. And so you can't say that you are efficient. On the other hand, we can use the rapid diagnostic test, get the results, treat him, and he'll get well. That way we have improved the health of the patient and ultimately the population. We have improved efficiency in our healthcare delivery. And as part of um, reducing per capita cost of healthcare, we can lower the cost of healthcare by encouraging uh, members of the community to participate in community-based health insurance programs as it will help to make healthcare services affordable. So we can't talk about the determinants of health without addressing um, health inequities and health inequalities. Equality means giving everyone the same thing, whereas equity means giving people what they need to reach their best health. So if you look at the picture by the right, assuming the fruit symbolizes good health, the different heights of people represents unequal distribution of the social determinants of health in our society. And if we treat these people equally by giving them the same size of boxes to stand on, only the tallest person would reach the fruits and would be healthy. However, if we treat them equitably, we would give them as many boxes as they need to reach the fruits and the shortest person would also have an equal chance to obtain uh, the fruit, which is health. Um, that's the same picture that we can see here showing equality and equity. Now, health inequalities describe differences in health status or in the distribution of health determinants between different population groups. And health inequities systematically puts groups of people who are already disadvantaged at a further disadvantage with respect to their health. So you have a woman who was born um, from a poor family and when she grows up, she, she would not be able to have a good education and that would bring her to a very low economic power. And so when she falls ill, even as an adult, she may not even be able to afford the healthcare service. So it puts her at a further disadvantage as regards her health. In other words, uh, equity accounts for disparities and equality does not. So in the pursuit of health equity, we need to address some social factors that can powerfully influence our health such as poverty, education, affordable housing, uh, employment, and access to healthcare. This is an example of equality and equity. If there is a community meeting where all members of the community are invited about a local environmental health concern, and this meeting is held in English language, though English is not the primary language for 25% of the residents, what do you think would happen? Let's assume that those 25% of the residents have uh, good information about how this environmental health concern can be eliminated. Then the meeting will not um, be productive because you're trying to maintain equality by calling everybody, but speaking only in English. To show equity, we can hold a meeting where community leaders hire translators to attend the meeting. So that way, the 25% that uh, can't speak English would be able to offer the solution they have to um, eliminating the local health, uh, the local environmental health concern. On the other hand, another meeting can be held in the local language so that they can participate and offer solutions to the problem. So why are we discussing population health and well-being? Population health is people focused. It provides for better patient satisfaction on individual levels and in entire groups as the cost of care goes down. It enables improved access to care when patients need it instead of later during emergency conditions because of cost considerations and, health and lack of health insurance, which is what really plays out um, in our environment. And then it can promote better patient engagement and empowers the patient manage their own health. Of course, this can come when we improve our patient experience as they um, assess our healthcare services. Population health encourages value for money. 
So you're not just seeing 100 patients, you are giving them the worth of their coming to access a healthcare service. So these are some practical applications of population health where we can support prevention and wellness initiatives. Recently, we see a lot of young people come out in the early hours of the morning to jog or go for a walk. Uh, this should be encouraged and we can encourage a safe environment so that they can do more of this. And then we can, um, another practical application is promoting healthier behaviors. So for uh, patients who are on long-term therapies, um, we can do a treatment adherence counseling for them and encourage them to complete their medications. And then we can encourage people to maintain um, a good lifestyle um, behaviors. Another practical application is implementing a community-based team approach in which healthcare providers and other community resource persons coordinate to meet people's need for medical care, food, housing, and social contact. So um, this is already um, ongoing for um, a disease like tuberculosis, especially in hard to reach communities. You have community resource persons that can go from house to house, identify people with um, chronic cough and who uh, they can collect their samples, test them and administer treatment to them. Um, ad, uh, advise them, give them some adherence counseling and encourage them to complete their therapy. So that way, members of the communities are helping each other to ensure that they maintain good population health status. So what are your benefits of studying um, population health? You'll be able to develop, implement, and evaluate comprehensive patient's plan to ensure that patients or population groups receive appropriate overall medical care and therapy. You'll be able to ensure that patients or population groups achieve optimal clinical outcomes through a seamless model of healthcare services. And you'll be able to assess health conditions of population groups or patients, ensure continuity of care, and document treatment progression. You'll also be able to provide individual and group counseling sessions concerning rehabilitation and health maintenance. So um, by way of conclusion, population health interventions include partnership across the continuum of care and into communities and groups. Interactions between the determinants of health, our health behaviors and lifestyle, an integrated healthcare system, the places and communities we live in can influence the health of populations. And to improve population health, collaborative actions by policymakers, healthcare providers, civic organizers, patients, and other key members of the community are required. No single individual organization or sector alone can achieve the goals of reducing costs, improving health, and creating healthy living conditions for populations.